All right, good morning. We're going to jump into the book of First Peter. We're going to finish chapter 3, Lord willing. Of course, it's always Communion Sunday, and that's always a challenge to try to get everything in, but uh, certainly want to be sensitive of your time. Uh, but we want to go over the scriptures uh, at least well. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace and your love. Thank you for the difficulties even that you send into our lives, that you teach us to get to the end of our own ropes and our own strength so that we might reach out to you. I thank you, Lord, for uh, everything that you have blessed us with. And I think of those who are, have been flooded out, entire towns have disappeared because of the floods. Lord, I pray you'd be with them, that you would shine through all the darkness, you'd shine through all the gloom, that you would glorify yourself, that you would glorify your son, that your people would be empowered to point others to you, that they would see your love through them. Pray that you might help us, Lord, and, and inspire us to do our part, and pray you be with them, Lord, as you do a work there. We pray that it might be a glorious thing for you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today we're in 1 Peter chapter 3. Suffering. <clears throat> it's interesting topic today. <laughs> Suffering. Suffering is one of those things that nobody seems to like, but on the other end of it, as you look back, there are all sorts of fruits and rewards that come from it. And there's a way to survive it, and then there's a way to just let it get to you so that you become bitter. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You know, bitter. Mm -hmm. If you ever, you know, you, you don't normally find bitterness in young people. I think it's because they have a very short memory. Uh, but you tend to find it in older people that have been through a lot. Uh, you can usually read it on their face. The sourness. And it, unforgiveness can begin to take hold in your heart and bitterness and questions and, uh, you know, why me? Uh, why did I have to go through this? And those kind of things hit most people. And I think if you don't know how to negotiate that and you don't know how to go through that trying time with the Lord, I think it can create you into being a very bitter person. So this is a, a, a very good topic for me today. Because I'm suffering as I talk to you. So, I... Oh, cut it out. All right. Thank you. I'm, I'm over that. Next thing. We're going to go over what we went over. Because good teaching is telling people what you're going to tell them and then telling them and then telling them what you told them. <laughs> Sorry if you're taking notes. Good teaching is when you tell people what you're going to tell them, and then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. And so you get to hear it three times. Forgive me, but last week we went through verses 7 to 12, and about the differences between husbands and wives, we went through previously the wives and husbands, how you are to live with your wife in an understanding fashion. That, gentlemen, we are like beer mugs and ladies are like wine glasses. You don't go crashing those things together uh, arbitrarily. You have to be gentle with wine glasses. If you've ever had to wash one, you understand the liability of having a wine glass out. They're, they're not built like, uh, like a good old-fashioned German beer mug, which I've never drunk from, but they, they look you know, pretty sturdy. And I imagine it would handle a good toast but if you were to smash those two things together, one would not last. And so we talked about that last week and about how God wishes us to honor our wives as princesses. You don't treat your husband as a princess, I hope. <laughs> but you should be treating your wife like one. <clears throat> the scripture then goes on to say, finally, be of one mind. The scripture tells us to be of one mind which uh, you don't need Mr. Spock to do. <laughs> to uh, be of having compassion for one another, that means to feel with, that means feeling it together. Love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. 
knowing that you were called to inherit a blessing. There's a sense in which we should care about each other and have empathy and sympathy and feel with one another. That's what happens when you care about somebody. If you don't care about somebody, then you don't feel anything for them. You know, they'll come up to you and tell you all their troubles and you go, wow, it really sucks to be you. Well, I'm just saying it because sometimes I say that. <laughs> so it's about having bowels of compassion, which we talked about uh, splachna, which is the, the Greek word for bowels, which, of course, you, you want to remember that. And also not to return evil for evil, <clears throat> which is our tendency if you were brought up on cartoons, because that's what the Roadrunner does, and that's what the, you know, I mean, that's what Bugs Bunny does, and that's what everybody does in the cartoon world. Uh, you know, you do something to me, I do something worse to you, then you do something three times worse to me, and then I quadruple that, and that's the way that we are in our flesh, right? Amen. Oh, one person, good. It's not just me. <clears throat> but this is the kind of thing that we do, and um, returning evil for evil is not a good idea and it doesn't ever work out and it never, you know, I got to get my feelings out. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't need to get your feelings out. You, you just bury it in the ground and let it die and it goes away and it's fine. You don't have to repress it. You have to deal with it, but you got to come to the Lord with it. And that's how you process it. That's how you deal with it. Um, if, if I'm mad at you and, and I punched everybody I'd be mad at, my goodness, I, you know, there would be a trail of bodies. And we can't do that. And some people live that way, and there's a trail of bodies behind them. This is not how we're to live. And when you're going through difficult times, boy, it's easy to lash out at people, and it's not even their fault that you're suffering. You know what I mean? Amen. Like me having a headache and me chewing my, my, my wife's head off. You know, It's not a good idea. It just doesn't work. And so that's what we do. We subscribe to this. And it says that he would love, good, love life and see good days. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Well, that just makes too much sense, doesn't it? Although it's sometimes difficult to be honest if you don't want people to know the real you. Or if you're trying to cover up an act that you're not proud of. Those are the reasons that we lie. It says that if you want to see a good life, then don't do that and refrain your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. It says, let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. So it's not just seeking peace. And you went to the bat one time, you know, I tried to talk to them. They didn't want to talk. So I'm done. It, it means to pursue peace, which means that there's this over and over repetitive thing. And so we always do that. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And so we ask God to put a guard on our mouth and that those things that come from our mouth are good for the edification of those who hear. It's not one of those things where you say, well, I'm just saying. Well, that's no excuse to say something, right? Amen. You know, you guys are very unresponsive today. <laughs> so what you do is you seek peace and pursue it like you're hunting. It's actually a hunting term in the original Greek. It's like Elmer Fudd looking for wabbits. So, and we understand that God is always watching and he knows what's going on with us. So we want to make sure that we live our lives in such a way that honor God wherever we are, whatever we do, whatever we say. Amen? Amen to that. So this week, we're going to talk about surviving suffering. And so I thought <laughs> it appropriate to cause my brother to suffer. <laughs> So, you guys like that, right? Every week I'll have a new face up there. <clears throat> we'll see how they survive suffering, Carl. I just think that's a brilliant piece of art, and I, I didn't want it to go to waste. Carl has turned 60 now in, in two weeks. So. Giving honor where honor is never asked for. There it is. We're going to pick it up in verse 13, 1 Peter. 
And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? Remember, he was talking about doing good and not evil, not evil for evil or hurting people back. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, which means it could happen, you're blessed. And do not be afraid of their frets, nor be troubled. That's from Isaiah 8, 12. I put the reference there for you. And this, it's interesting because Peter lived this. Peter's not just telling us to do something in this epistle. He actually did this. You remember when Peter and John were called on the carpet for healing a guy, and they went before the Sanhedrin, and they said, you got to stop talking in the name of Jesus. And he goes, well, whether it's better for us to listen to you or listen to God, you, you be the judge. In other words, that ain't going to happen in Jersey. And so... He says, who's going who's gonna to make you suffer if you do good? Because you know the Lord's got your back, right? I mean, I think about other, other situations like Paul and Silas when they were in prison. If you remember, they were uh, grabbed and thrown in prison. They were put in stocks, and at midnight, they began to worship God. And the, the prison doors came off their hinges, and they got, they got loose of their shackles, and they were ready to go. It was all, it was all over. And they could have left, except there was a, a guard out front who knew it was his life if anybody was escaped, and he was ready to run himself through. And he said, whoa, 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 we're all here. And they were able to share the gospel with them, and he and his entire household get saved. And so, who's going to do bad to you if you want to do good? But sometimes, if you're going to do a good thing, sometimes you get punished, but the Lord's in on it. And that's what you want. And that's how you're going to survive suffering, is if the Lord's in on it and you understand, maybe I don't know why this is happening, but maybe he'll tell me. Maybe I don't understand why it's happening, but I know he'll tell me what to do in it so that I can process it properly. And there's, there are always reasons for the things that the Lord does. In Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul but rather fear him who is able to destroy, destroy both soul and body in hell. Uh, the ultimate destination of those who have rejected Jesus Christ. Um, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be concerned about God and about his, you know, judgment of me. I'm not going to worry about other people and, you know, their faces. Sometimes, you know, somebody make a face at you and we're so sensitive as a people now, right? Aren't you guys sensitive people? <laughs> of course you are. I think about Peter, who was hung upside down. That's how he died. Professing Jesus Christ as the Son of God, professing that he rose from the dead, professing he was a follower, said, I am not worthy to die like my Lord. Please don't crucify me. I don't, I'm not even worthy to be in the same category. Like John the Baptist said, I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. And so Peter was hung upside down by his election because he didn't feel worthy to die like his Lord. And so Peter telling this, hey, who's going to hurt you if you want to do good? But if in the middle of doing good, you're going to suffer for righteousness sake, you're blessed. He lived it out. He wasn't just a hypocrite. He wasn't just writing this stuff, you know, and say, oh, it's a great idea. It's a good theory. No, he lived it out, which is a much better example than just telling someone something. And he gives us further survival methods. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you Amen. with meekness and fear. So not only does he tell us what to say, but he tells us how to say it. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. I don't know if you've ever had anybody come up to you and say, what is up with you? And you say, what do you mean? You don't get involved in the gossip. You're, you're not a womanizer. You know, the guys are showing pictures of pornography and stuff and you, you don't want anything to do with it. What, what is this about you? What is, I mean, for lunch, you sit down and read the Bible? I mean, what's up with that? Have you ever had people come up to you and ask you? The scripture says that you should be ready to give an answer 
to those who ask for the hope that's in you. The question is, do they see hope in you? If I'm going to be ready to give an explanation for the hope that's in me and be obedient to the scripture, I better have some hope in me. I, you know, hope is, a, hope is an elusive thing, and people aren't going to know what it is unless you give some word to it. But the first thing we do is we sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. We put God on the throne of our heart, and we make him the most important thing in our life, which means, you know, there are things I'm not going to do. There are things I'm not going to say. There are places I'm not going to go. And there are things that I will do. And there are things that I'm going to say. And it's a purposeful thing. And I have a hope. I have a hope that I have a Savior who came and died for me so that I might enter into heaven, not because I'm worthy, but because I re received a free gift. And that's the bottom line of the gospel, right? And that's the hope that we have. And Jesus showed that it's real because he died, was gone for three days, and then he resurrected and he showed himself, and he was seen by over 1,500 people. Amen. And so he showed that what he says is true because he defied death. That's our hope is because Jesus Christ was resurrected, not just his teaching, but the demonstration of his power over death. And he says that he goes to prepare a place for us. So I believe him. Amen. So we sanctify the Lord God as uh, uh, the Lord God in our hearts. We put him as first in our hearts, like you would take the crown jewels and put them in, in a case and, and lock them up, something that's very expensive. They put it on display. I understand you can actually go see it, um, but don't try reaching into your pocket because they'll pull a gun on you. So we sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. And that's the first thing that we do. I think about Daniel. Daniel, when he was captivated as a teenager and brought to Babylon, this 700 mile trek, he was made a slave and because he was handsome, because he, he came from a noble family, because he was intelligent. I mean, he, he got the scholarship, you know, and he was put in charge by the head of the eunuchs, which means he was one of those. That's a heck of a sacrifice for a teenager. And he put himself into the service of God. But the first thing they wanted him to do was eat the king's food and drink the king's wine. Kind of the antichrist sort of communion. You know, the, the food and the wine of the king, which were completely non-kosher, sacrificed to idols, against everything that he grew up in. And it says that Daniel purposed in his heart not to take of the king's delicacies. He purposed in his heart. First thing, he sanctified the Lord God in his heart as first. And he purposed in his heart, not going to do that. And then he figured out a really respectful way to say, listen, why don't you just put us to the test? We're going to do something crazy here. Just feed us vegetables. <laughs> Yeah, it would be a miracle because <laughs> vegetables don't have everything that you need. But he said, instead of this, just give us vegetables and we'll see how that goes. And the head of the eunuch said, I don't know, dude, that's not going to, in Jersey. I don't know, dude, that's not, not a good idea. I'm risking my neck here. And he goes, just test this out for 10 days. And after 10 days, he and the other three, they look better than all the other guys because he purposed in his heart and God blessed it. And that's the first thing we do is we sanctify the Lord God as Lord in our heart. He's the boss of me. He tells me what to do, where to go, when to do it. And as long as we're in submission to that boy, we're walking in the spirit and everything goes very well. He also says, be ready. It means to be in the position where you're ready to launch at any point in time. You know, um, you know what it is to be ready? Amen. What are you guys ready to do right now? Sleep. So sorry. <laughs> I will try to use my voice. <laughs> it's a trick. I don't want to do that. But to be ready, to be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in you. That takes preparation, doesn't it? If you're going to go and enter the New York Marathon and you pay your money and you get your, you know, thing and then you dress like you're going to a gay pride parade, you know, with the tight lycra, you know, skin tight, bright colors, and you're... Uh, that's, that's just some of the exterior preparations. But you better, be, you better be ready to run a marathon, man. 
You're going to go a block or two and go. <laughs> <laughs> You're not prepared. <clears throat> if somebody were to come up to you and say, listen, I, I noticed this inner joy that you have, this sort of hope that you have. What, what's that about? Would you be able to give them a cogent, yes. cognizant, well thought out, Direct word. <laughs> Never leave your wife's side and you'll always have the words. That's good. I like that. <laughs> but the scripture speaks to us all individually, and so we should all be ready to give a reason for the hope that's in you, unless the hope isn't in you. If the hope isn't in you and you feel a little hollow at the moment, well, then you need to give your life to Jesus Christ. Amen. But if you know Jesus Christ, there is a reason for hope in you and to withhold that from the rest of the world would be robbery. For the hope that is in you, it's an expectancy of a coming good. That's what hope is. It's not cross your fingers, oh, I hope so. It's not that. It's an expectancy. It's like Christmas morning. That's what hope is. And our Christmas morning is the resurrection, boys and girls. It'll be the day in which the Lord either comes for us or we go to meet him. That is our hope. Be ready for the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Meekness and fear. So when sharing the gospel or responding to somebody, we're to do it with meekness and fear. That doesn't look like a lot of people I see on TV. Or a lot of people I see yelling and screaming on the street corners, you know, repent, God is coming. You're all going to hell. I don't see a lot of meekness and fear in that. And I don't see anybody giving an explanation for the hope that's in you either. I mean, it's a good way to get yourself hurt. But it's also a good way to have people shut even more to the gospel. So if you're going to give a reason for the hope that's in you, do it with meekness, which is power under control. Power under control means, oh my goodness, you ask me a question, I have to answer you. Oh, wait. Let's start in Genesis chapter 1. Oh, 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 whoa. I, I understand you have energy and you think you have three hours with this person, but you might not. You might not have three hours with every person. So meekness is power under control. It means I'm going to say something to somebody that they need, not necessarily tell them everything I know. Do you know the difference? You don't think I do. I know you do. But this is all edited, trust me. With meekness and fear, which means respect. And you have to understand that when somebody asks you a question like that, it's like a spiritual bubble suddenly. It's like around you. I don't know if you've ever sensed this. It's like, here's a spiritual moment. I remember uh, my kids growing up, they would ask me a question. And I knew that that question opened a window. And it was like, God, help me not to screw this one up. Where do babies come from? <laughs> meekness and fear. Meekness and fear. Okay. <laughs> Mommies and daddies and in the belly. And there you go. That's, that's all good when they're three. That's a good enough answer. You don't go into fallopian tubes and, you, you, you know, it's... Let's get the chart out. Let's consult, you know, the anatomy. Let's have some show and tell here. When they get a little older, it's probably appropriate to hear from you instead of school because school will tell them all sorts of things. But meekness and fear means power under control, and you do it with respect because there's a window that's open, and you don't want to shut it by talking too much or, you know, or just pretending you know so much. It's not about that. It's about people getting saved. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. I have a, an artist's rendition of Stephen. If you remember in the book of Acts in chapter 6, Stephen is giving an account. He's a deacon in the church, by the way. He's a servant. And they say that he's blaspheming against Moses and all this stuff. And they throw him in the center and they kind of have a mock trial in, in the middle of the area where they are. And there's a guy who set this all up, and his name is Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus is in the back watching and listening to every word. 
you know what Stephen does? He goes all the way back into Genesis and he starts and he shows the history of the Jewish people and how he knows more than a lot of those guys standing in the crowd. And he gives this awesome sermon. I would encourage you to read it, chapter 6 of Acts. He gives this awesome sermon about the Jewish people and everything that they've done. And then when he gets to the end and he goes, see, you people always reject the Holy Spirit. Based upon all the information that he just gave them, and he quoted the Septuagint. I mean, this guy is, he's a deacon. He's, you know, can I get you some coffee? Can I, you know, can he cleans up your bottles when you leave them here? And he's a guy who preached this sermon right off the top of his head. There's a guy who gives a reason for hope. And it says when he got to that point, he goes, you guys always reject the Holy Spirit. When, what, uh, when of your forefathers did they ever receive what God said? All the prophets were murdered by your hands and by your ancestors. And that's when they tore their clothes and they threw rocks at him and he died. Because he preached the most awesome sermon and it went right to the heart. And there was a man listening named Saul of Tarsus. And I see the Lord saves him at some point and speaks to him personally, knocks him off his horse. And he asks him, he goes, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. What goads? He was listening to Stephen's sermon. And Stephen's words were like this on him. And God was trying to prompt him to change. And it says that Stephen stood before them and he had what appeared to be the face of an angel. You know what that's called? Spiritual endowment. That's a dude who knows the Lord. That's a guy who's at peace with God. And don't you want people to ask you why you look that way? Why? What's with the hope? Be ready for that because it'll happen. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil, which means sometimes you're going to do good and suffer for it. Sometimes, if it is the will of God. By the way, it's not always the will of God for you to suffer for doing good. But when it is, it's better to suffer for doing good than it is evil, right? right? Nobody likes to know that. Nobody wants to hear that. You mean I have to suffer for doing good sometimes? Yeah. Sometimes you'll be blamed for something's not your fault? Yeah. Sometimes you're going to have to take a hit when it was actually somebody else? Yeah. Do you trust God in that? See, that's the question. Or are you going to defend yourself? Oh, oh, it wasn't me. That's the way we are in the flesh, right? Can you apologize for something you didn't do? Can you take the blame for something you didn't do? Jesus did. A little longer, 1 Peter chapter 4, we'll get to it. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial in which is to try you as though some strange thing were happening to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake in Christ's sufferings. In other words, we're going through the same kind of things that Jesus did in much smaller quantity. That when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And on their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he's glorified. In other words, if people are going to tear you up because you're a Christian and you're a real believer in Jesus, that's cool. It's cool because they recognize you as a follower of Jesus. Boy, that's a whole lot better than, you know, the undercover brother who's like all camouflaged and nobody even knows they're a Christian. You know, did you ever find out that somebody's a Christian at work or your neighbor or somebody that you knew and you go, you're a Christian? They go, well, of course, brother. <laughs> what? had a relationship with you for 12 years and I never knew that never saw you do any never saw a reason for hope in you like what's up with that Jesus said you're the light of the world a city on a hill can't be hidden if you're really a believer you're going to be shining and that's just the way that it is even if it's difficult even if it's hard because the spirit of God rests upon you when you're suffering for him 
Not when you're suffering for your own wrong. We should suffer for our own wrong. I do a stupid thing. I should suffer. I get it. You know, if I, if I crash into your car, I should pay for that. That's just the way it is. If, if I hurt you, I should do what I can to recompense that and make that right. But if, if, I'm, if I'm doing well in suffering, that's a hard thing to take, isn't it? That's why we have to be conscious of God in our life. And we have to sanctify the Lord God as king in our heart, right? For Christ also suffered, by the way, Jesus suffered, so he's not asking you to do something he didn't do. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. You see, Jesus showed us the example, and then we follow that example, that we just, we're, we're going to die. We're going to die to ourselves, and we're going to be accused of all sorts of things that aren't true. So what? Are we going to get all, you know, judgmental or are we going to get all angry or bitter, you know, or say, God, you know what you're doing. I want you to take over here. I want you to work this out. And that's a, a much better way to go because there are, then the glory of God rests on you, right? But Jesus left us an example that we should follow. Second Corinthians 4, 16, 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing. Can I get an amen from the older folk? Amen. Okay, wow, that was vigorous. <laughs> Although the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Amen. For our light affliction, another version says our light momentary affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we do not look at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporary but the things which are not seen are eternal that is one of the things that we do as a Christian is we look forward to our real home and we don't get too attached to our temporary home this is just temporary right yes. by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Peter's going along nice here and then suddenly he hits this big doctrinal chunk right here. <laughs> so let's go through it. When did Jesus go in to see spirits in prison? I, I, don't, I didn't remember him going to prison ever. I wonder what he was in for. <laughs> but he went and he preached to the spirits in prison who were formerly were disobedient when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Well, there's one theory on this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I don't typically do. Is I'm going to give you all the theories. Number one, that Jesus preached to lost souls. Lost souls who, which were in Tartarus or in uh, which you might know as Gehenna or hell. Uh, there are different places. Hades and hell are two different places. Uh, I don't want to split hairs with you people. This isn't Bible college. Anyway. Jesus preached to lost souls. Clement of Alexandria, who's uh, an ancient church father, one of the first Christian men, actually said this, that Jesus went and he went down into Sheol, which is the Old Testament version of uh, kind of the waiting room where everybody goes when they die, and you have a good section and a bad section. And Jesus went there and he preached to them so that they might get saved and say, hey, anybody want to go to heaven? So that's one theory, that Jesus went and preached to those who were in prison, the, those who are being uh, held captive until the next stage. Hebrews 9.27 kind of flies in the face of that, and it says, And it is appointed unto man to die once, but after this, the judgment. If it's appointed unto a person once to die and then the judgment, that means you don't get a second chance. Jesus doesn't make a personal appearance while you're in prison waiting for your judgment and you get a second chance. So that kind of flies in the face of that. So 
But there's one theory that somebody might tell you, and they'll say it is one of the oldest traditions uh, because it comes from Clement of Alexandria, who was an early church leader. Good? Next thing. If I can figure out how to work this thing. Augustine and Aquinas believe that he was speaking of Noah's preaching, that the spirit of Christ was in Noah's preaching, and that through Noah, Christ was speaking to them to be saved. So by whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient, who once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. So uh, both uh, Augustine and Aquinas subscribe to this theory, which is that vicariously God was speaking to those who are now past and gone, and that Noah preached for 120 years, and those people did not respond. And there were only eight people that got saved. So there's that theory, and you have a couple of people like Augustine and Aquinas, some, some other brothers that uh, went long before some doctors. First Peter 1, 10 to 11 says this, uh, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or by what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So you see, the spirit of Christ is also the spirit that inspired the prophets. So for the spirit of Christ to inspire Noah to preach to these people who were disobedient, that would make sense that Noah preached to these folks while they were there before the judgment came. And you know what happened? The door was closed. The Lord closed the door and he brought judgment, brought the water of judgment down on the people and he started new. And there were eight people that were saved. So the spirit of Christ through Noah, that's another theory that could happen. And you have a couple of people that subscribe to that. So we'll take a vote in a minute and, and see what you guys think. But the third one is that these were fallen angels, that Jesus went and preached. By the way, that word preached is Caruso. Caruso is not evangelon. Evangelon is to preach the good news to somebody uh, with the aim of them repenting, being right with God and getting saved. Caruso is an announcement. It's, uh, it's more like a declaratory thing. So it's, it's more like preaching and, and, and less like evangelism. So that these were fallen angels, the ones who were disobedient, who were formerly disobedient, and once in the divine long suffering, he waited in the days of Noah. Now, you, you have these in chapter 6 of the book of Genesis, you have these fallen angels who come, these Nephilim, which means the fallen ones, who come, and it says that the sons of God married or had relations with the, the daughters of men and they married any of them that they chose and then there was this offspring of giants that were on the land. And so there are people who take this passage and if you go to the book of Jude verse 6 it also talks about this that they were kept imprisoned that they were kept chained until the day of judgment that the angels who fell that did that right now are being chained they're not walking around Jesus didn't let them off the hook God imprisoned them immediately and put them in a place in Revelation it does say that they'll be let go for a time so, but we'll, we, we don't want to get into Revelation we'll be here all day so there were giants in the earth in those days, and afterward the sons of God came to the daughters of men, and he bore children to them. Those were mighty men of old, men of renown, those who were giants. And if you go online, you can find all sorts of proof that there were giants on the earth. Some of it's true, and some of it's manufactured. But the scripture tells us that that's what happened. And so the other one is that, that Jesus went down and announced the fact that it's done, it, it is finished, that he declared judgment to those who were in Sheol, and he led captives in his train so that those who were waiting ended up going to a place called paradise. Jesus told the, the thief on the cross when he was next to him, he says, I tell you this day, today you will be with me in paradise, or the, the bosom of Abraham, if you will. So there's, there's this whole theory on heaven and hell, and, or heaven and Hades, and Tartarus, and I, I, I'm sorry to have taken so long on this, but anyway... Uh, I have a feeling it was those who were disobedient. I believe it was the fallen angels. So that's kind of the direction I go. 
And yet, in 1 Peter 4, 6, he talks about this in the next chapter. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. So you see, you can, you can look at passages, and if you go at it with a predisposed position, you can see what you want to see. Do you see that? It's really difficult to come to the scriptures and just say, what in the world does it say? And then believe what it says. Because all of us drag something in. How many of you are former Catholics? Yeah, you, there's some of, some of that in you. Okay? So like when you see the cross up, up in the front of the church, you go, oh wait, no, I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> And we, we drag that stuff in, you know, and then there are other people looking at you like, what's going on? We drag stuff with us. Yeah. Anyway, so that's, that's my particular opinion, but you, you guys can make up your own mind, obviously. Verse 21. There is an, also an antitype. There's a pattern, okay? There's a, there's a, a picture, if you will. An antitype which now saves us. Baptism. And in parentheses, because Peter doesn't want us to get the wrong idea, he says, not the removal of the filth from the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. This whole long dissertation ends with powers and authorities being subject to him. In other words, Jesus submitted himself to the suffering he went through, and the benefit was that his name was lifted up above every other name. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Because of all the things that Jesus went through, look at all that was accomplished, and all authority now bends to him even though he took the blame and the sin of the whole world, the scripture teaches. So that's the, to encapsulate the idea. But going line by line, there is this antitype that saves us. Baptism. How many of you were saved when you got baptized? I know what I said. <laughs> Do you know what the one outlier of salvation is in a Christian? The presence and fruit of the Holy Spirit. In fact, baptism, very often when the scripture talks about baptism, it's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it says that God will pour out his spirit. In fact, in the Old Testament, before baptism was a deal, he said, I will pour out my spirit. It's interesting he uses a water picture that he pours out his spirit. And it's, it's over and over. I had some from the prophets. I, I, I knew we were going to run short, so I didn't add all. But there are all kinds of beliefs on this. It says that baptism saves us. So that's cool. Then I could just go get baptized, then I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, I'm good, I got my golden ticket. If that's what it means, exactly what it means, then, then that's all I have to do. And for the Jew, it was circumcision. All I have to do is nip the tip and I'm good. <laughs> and yet, God never talks about the, physicals, the physical act and having that save you. He says, if you're circumcised, you need to be circumcised in heart. The outside needs to be a picture of what's going on on the inside. And if it's not, the outside doesn't matter. Amen. And it was such a problem for the early Christians that there were Judaizers, those who were Jews, who were Christians. And they said, yeah, you, you could be a Christian like us, except you've got to get circumcised. And these Gentiles were like, what? <laughs> And Paul, who's the most learned of, of all the disciples, argued this fact. In fact, he was the, the ambassador to the Gentiles by his own words. And he didn't encourage them to, to do any of that stuff. He encouraged them to have faith in Jesus Christ. And so he ended up going to Jerusalem and saying, hey, boys, there were some guys that came from here that said everyone's got to get circumcised. Uh, that's not my gospel. But if, I mean, straighten me out if I'm wrong. 
And they had a big conversation about it, and they finally said, you know what, you're right. Sorry about that. We had some people that came out from Jerusalem that supposedly came from James, who's the half-brother of Jesus, and were saying, you've got to get circumcised. You've got to obey the law. You've got to eat all the right stuff. You've got to observe the Sabbath day. You've got to, 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 and then, then you're saved. Then you can be a Christian. You can accept Jesus. He's like the bottom box for you to check off. And Peter said, um, friends and brothers, uh, why should we put something on the backs of the Gentiles we ourselves couldn't bear? And he says, not that long ago, I went into the house of Cornelius, and I preached to them, and they all began to speak in tongues. That's evidence of what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. They weren't baptized yet. But they all spoke in tongues, even as we, or sorry, we, they spoke in tongues like we did. So why should I withhold water from them and baptize them? Because that was the next stage. The next thing to do is to get baptized, make a public proclamation of what already occurred in your heart. The only time in the scriptures where the Holy Spirit comes at baptism is Jesus. It's the only one. You don't find anything else in the scripture. When somebody gets baptized, they get the Holy Spirit and ta-da, they're saved. In fact, there were lots of people who received the Holy Spirit and then they got baptized. There were a lot of people that got saved and then they got baptized. There were people that were baptized in the baptism of John, and they weren't baptized into Christ Jesus because Apollos didn't have his theology all straight. And so all these people were getting baptized in the baptism of John because that was like the thing to do, except they didn't know the baptism of Jesus Christ, which is different. It's baptizing. It's recognizing him as Lord and Savior, dedicating your entire life. And as you go under the water, you're dying you're, you're, you're symbolized by his death. And by coming back out of the water, you're going to live in newness of life. There's this figurative washing that occurs. But that washing doesn't, it, it doesn't have magical properties in the water, like holy water. That's what you say when you have a really glass, good glass of water. You go, holy water. <laughs> or at least that's what Robin would say. So that's, it says here, there's this antitype, which is, you have this picture of Noah. By the way, there was water involved with Noah's salvation, wasn't there? Except those waters were the waters of judgment. Because they, they destroyed all the people who weren't alive. What, what saved Noah and his family was the ark. Right? Jesus is the ark, right? And then you have to say, well, then, do animals get saved? You have to be careful with your theology that you don't stretch things to the breaking point where you don't. An antitype is a prefiguring. It's not an exact perfection, right? So we have this antitype that now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth from the flesh, so not the water itself, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. How do you have a good conscience toward God? When I know and receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, that he died for my sins, and that my sins were paid for with his blood. It's not water that saves me. It's blood. It's worse. It's a slaughterhouse religion, people say. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So it's about doing good. Here's the, here's the picture of Jesus. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened. By the way, Luke tells us he prayed. Which, is, which tells me that's why things happened. The heaven was opened. The Holy Spirit descended in a bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, You are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. Now that's the whole package. He's, he got baptized. But see, he got baptized with the baptism of John. But that wasn't the, baptize, it wasn't the baptism that all the disciples did. So maybe Jesus should have been rebaptized. <laughs> the thing is, you can look too intently into things and twist them into something that they're not, 
Or you could just read for what it is and say, okay, Lord, I get it. So next week, I will do my best not to embarrass Carl. <laughs> we'll be in 1 Peter chapter 4, where he's going to talk about darkness and light. And we're going to look at some of those contrasting things in our lives. And uh, hope you guys are enjoying going through the book of Peter with me.